right, if you have uh, your Bibles, if you have your phone, if you have your iPad, whatever it is, if you have a device that has the Bible on it, today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be looking at one verse from Matthew chapter 5. Before I begin, um, let me remind you, how many still have your ropes in your Bible that we gave last week? If you have your rope, uh, remember to pray for Amy and Biba and Moise. Um, they've returned to Burkina Faso and uh, already jumped right back into ministry uh, officially. Uh, Amy, uh, the directorship of, of the orphanage and the ministry was transferred to Amy. Obviously, Mike was the director before, and Amy has assumed all of those responsibilities. So in the midst of still grieving Mike's loss, uh, there's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of ministry going on, and they need our prayers. And so let me encourage you, be faithful praying for them. Let's hold the rope. Let's not drop the rope. Let's lift them up in prayer uh, on a regular basis. Well, today, uh, as we begin the message, we uh, honor the Girl Scouts. And we have uh, the Hibiscus Service Unit. I said it correctly this time. The Hibiscus Service Unit that is here with us today. We honor the Girl Scouts, an organization that was founded some 104 years ago. So, Brian, why are you recognizing them this week? Because this week is the anniversary of the Girl Scouts on March 12th. The Girl Scouts celebrate 104 years. Now, I have to confess, I don't know a lot about Girl Scouts. I have to confess that. I do know that I really like tag-along cookies, though. <laughs> I really like those. And so if you have any more of those just available, um, I would be thrilled to uh, take them <laughs> off of your hands. You have some. You have some. You have a whole case. Where's Vicky? Vicky. I need to connect these two people at the end of the service. I do know that each Girl Scout makes a promise, and I'm not sure whether the girls can remember the promise that they make. Each Girl Scout makes this promise. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country. Do you have to lift up the two fingers? Okay. All right. On my honor, I'm not a Girl Scout, but I, I know I can't be. On my honor, I promise or I will try to serve God and my country and help people at all times and to live by the Girl Scout law. All right, boy, they knew it by heart, all right? So you say, okay, they promised to live by the Girl Scout law. What's the Girl Scout law? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is the Girl Scout law that each of the girls promised to live by. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong and responsible for what I say and do, great qualities, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and, and be a sister to every Girl Scout. And so... Uh, we didn't even practice that, did we, ladies? We didn't practice that at all. And so the Girl Scouts promised to make the world a better place. Well, the goal of today's message, to me it's always cool the way God kind of joins everything together. The goal of today's message addresses the Girl Scout goal to make the world a better place. Now, believe it or not, there is someone even more important, more influential than the hibiscus service unit that desires to make the world a better place. And obviously today I'm speaking of none other than Jesus Christ himself, who desires to make our lives better and through us desires to make the world better. And so today we're reading one simple text in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. And so as I mentioned, if you have if you have an old-fashioned Bible like I have, or you have a, a phone or an iPad, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, follow along as I read. Jesus says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Can you read that with me? We'll, we put it up on the screen today. I'm reading out of the ESV. Let's read it together. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the the sons of God. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at your word today, 
Help us to understand what true peace really is. Lord, we admit that the world in which we live has a, has a warped idea of what peace is. Help us to understand peace. Help us to understand how we can obtain that peace. Lord, in a, in a troubled world, in a world that has so little peace, help us to understand today how the peace of God can rule our mind and our hearts. Help us to understand how that we can have peace with God. And then, Lord, even beyond that, help us to understand how that we can be makers of peace. Lord, we can be um, encouraging. Lord, we can be um, resolving conflicts. We can be even demonstrators of the peace of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live. And even more importantly, we can direct people to you, the Prince of Peace. And so, Lord, thank you for this truth. Help us to understand it today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount, which is uh, Jesus' largest sermon in the New Testament and uh, a phenomenal sermon. If you've never read all of it, it's Matthew chapters 5, 6, my, Matthew chapter 5 and 6, and we're going to be studying all of that. We've titled the sermon Flipped. The idea being because uh, the ideas that Jesus conveys and these verses kind of turn uh, the way that the world thinks and maybe even the way that we think kind of flips it upside down and it kind of turns over the way that you and I should approach life, the way that you and I should live life. The, the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mount begins with what are called the Beatitudes, um, Little, little sayings that Jesus made that begin with the word blessed. And we've talked about how the word blessed literally means happy. And so over and over again, he says, happy or blessed are those, but blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, happy are the poor in spirit, happy are those who mourn. And the word happy there literally means an eternal joy that is not dependent upon our circumstances. In other words, we can live in a troublesome world. We can live in a world that has very little peace, and, then you, and yet you and I, in our hearts and our minds, can experience what? Can experience true peace. When we know the Prince of Peace, we can experience true peace no matter what is going on around us. Now, you would admit with me today that peace is a rare commodity, is it not? In the world in which we live, peace is a rare commodity. I read this statistic. I have no way of verifying whether it's true, but it certainly called my attention. And so let me give the statistic out. And our, um, our experts who check those things, you can Google it. I'm sure some of you will be doing during the service this morning. But, but uh, since 1945, they say that there has only been, or there have only been 26 days of peace. Now think about that. What they mean by that, since 1945, there have only been 26 days in which there has not been a war going on somewhere in our world. Let me say that again. In the last 29,000 plus days, there have only been 26 days in which there was not fighting someplace upon our planet. That, that kind of amazed me. Now, once again, I can't verify whether that statistic is true. If it's not exactly true, I'm sure it's pretty close to true. But as I was thinking about that, I thought, you know what? But even if that's true, even if there were 26 days in which there was not a single battle that was going on, there was not a single country that was fighting with another country, even on those 26 days, I guarantee you that there was someone who got in an argument. I guarantee you there was someone who got in a fight. There was someone who had a brawl. There, there was someone who had a skirmish. I say all of that to say this. What does our world need? Our world desperately needs peace. Not only does our world desperately need peace, but our country desperately needs peace. We live in a divided country. 
in this day and age. Our country needs peace. Our city needs peace. You might sit back today and say, shoot, Brian, my family needs peace today, all right? I just need some peace. And, and, you know, you probably at times yelled out, you know, just give me a little bit of peace. Or uh, if I could just have a moment of peace. If you have kids running around the house, moms, you probably sometimes sat back and thought, oh, if I could only have five minutes of peace. Haven't you? Well, the truth is that we all long for peace. Not just a superficial peace, but real peace. Real God-given peace. That's what Jesus is talking about in the verse that we're studying today. So I want to answer just a few simple questions today. The first question is this, what is the meaning of peace? When Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, it's important for us to understand what is it that Jesus means? What does that word peace mean? And then secondly, a question that dovetails right on the back end of that is, once we understand it, how can I obtain it? How how can you and I have peace today? And then the third question is this, who are the peacemakers? Uh, What does it mean to be a peacemaker? And the fourth question, as you look at the verse, who are the sons of God? Who are the sons and daughters of God? So so dig in with me today. The first question is this. What does it mean, or what does the word peace mean? What is the real meaning of the word peace? Now, now quite frankly, the word's description, the word's definition of peace is different from God's definition. The, The Bible contains some 350 references to peace from the beginning to the end. Now, Now think with me, you get this. The Bible opens with peace, right? They're they're in the Garden of Eden. God created a perfect environment and placed Adam and Eve in a perfect, peaceful environment. And then what happened? Sin entered in and peace left the garden, all right? And so there really has not been peace. And so we see real peace there in the Garden of Eden. And then we don't see it corporately again until the end of the Bible. Until all the way at the end of the Bible when all of a sudden God once again takes control and Jesus is on the throne. Then and only then the world will experience what? Real peace. So, so from uh, the beginning there was peace, and at the end there was peace, but in between the beginning and the end, what is there? No peace. Now, guess what? Guess where we live? In between the Garden of Eden and in between Jesus' return. It's important for us to know that. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I can't have peace, but it means that in creation, there will not be pure peace until the consummation of everything that God has established. There there are two words in the Bible that are translated peace. You're probably familiar with the first one. The first one is an Old Testament word, and it's the word shalom. How many have heard the word shalom before? All right. The word shalom is translated peace. The word shalom literally means wholeness or complete peace. Now, if you come from a Jewish background, I'm sure we probably have some people here today that come from a Jewish background. The word shalom is used as a traditional greeting. And so you might greet someone and you would say shalom to them, or you might be leaving and you might say shalom. From what I understand, the traditional greeting is actually shalom alechem. Can you say that with me today? Shalom alechem. It means it's a greeting. It's kind of like, how are you? But it means what? It means peace be to you. And the response they tell me, apologies to any of our Jewish crowd if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but I'm doing the very best that I can, because the response to shalom alechem is then alechem shalom. And so, and, and so you greet and you say, peace be unto you, and the response back is, and unto you, peace as well. Modern translation, right back at you, <laughs> all right? Somebody says, shalom alechem, and you're like, right back at you, alechem shalom. Just as you desire peace to me, so I desire peace 
to you. That, uh, that's a common Old Testament word. It's found 237 times in the Old Testament. Here are just a couple of times. You're familiar with maybe these two verses. Psalm 119, 165. David says, great peace, shalom, great peace, have those who love your law. Is that me? I'm telling you there's no peace in the world and what happens? <laughs> Even with the sound system, there's no peace. Let's try that again. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So the Old Testament word that's used frequently is the word shalom. Uh, the New Testament word obviously is not a Hebrew word. It's a, it's a Greek word, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it today because I would, I would mess it up. I would do a Greek word with a Spanish pronunciation, and that, that just doesn't fly. And so, But the New Testament term means to join together into a whole. It has the idea of taking all of these different pieces, all of these different parts, and pulling them together and joining them into a whole. I was trying to think of the best way to describe that, and I thought of my, my wife, Vicki, first of all, because she's whole and she's Are we good? Is my mic on? All right. And so... Vicky's like this. I mean, when is a mom the happiest? When what? When all of the family is together. Are we, uh, moms, do you agree with me? Uh, that's when moms are the happiest, all right? When all of the family is together. And so Vicky is the happiest whenever Mark and April are here and they're here and Amber is here. And also when Justin and Jenny and Isabella come in from Guatemala and all of the different pieces of our family have what? They've come together. And I would love to tell you that's probably not a perfect illustration because when all of us are together, it's not the most peaceful thing, all right? There's people talking and yelling and running around the house, but that's kind of the idea of the word that's used in, in the New Testament, this term of, of joining together. Um, uh, let me just uh, give you an illustration in John 14, 27. We'll look at this verse later, but Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. And so what does Jesus mean? Or what does he give? He gives us peace. If you read the Pauline epistles, in almost every single one of Paul's epistles, he begins with this phrase, grace to you and peace from God the Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about the meaning, the apostle Paul is saying, man, in the midst of a hectic life, Here's what God wants to do. God wants to give you grace, and God wants to pull everything together, to join it together so that it is perfect, so that it is wholesome. But, but here's the, the point that I really want you to catch. Because in the New Testament, the word peace does not just mean an absence of conflict. The word peace doesn't just mean, okay, no more fighting, no more arguing, no more wars. If that was the case, that would be simple. But that's not what the, word, what the New Testament word means. Absence of, con absence of conflict, but it also means the presence of righteousness. Follow me. And so there's, a, there's no more conflict, but there is what? There is righteousness. And so you pulled the problems out of the way, you pulled the badness out of the way, but you have infused, instead of that badness, you have infused what? You have infused goodness. And so it's not just, okay, we're not going to fight anymore. No, no. Real peace is, it's not that we're just not going to say bad words to each other, but we're actually going to resolve our conflicts. We're actually going to restore our relationships. You see, only righteousness can produce the relationship that brings parties together. 
You see, the world's idea of peace is we don't like each other, so we're just going to avoid each other. Yeah, you know, when you're walking down the street, I'm going to go to the other side of the street so I don't have to communicate with you. That, that's worldly peace, but that's not godly peace. Godly peace is righteousness as godliness is seeing my enemy on the other side of the street and me crossing over to the other side of the street and loving on that person with whom I have had difficulties and conflicts. Breaking that, that enmity that existed between us. You see, man can stop fighting without righteousness, but they cannot live peaceably without righteousness. And so when Jesus talks about real peace, he's not just talking about the absence of conflict. He's talking about the presence of righteousness. Now, we get to the answer to all of that. So you say, Brian, what does that mean? Well, if you're following along your outlines, it means this. Without Jesus, it is impossible to have real peace. Let me say that again. Without Jesus, it is impossible to have real peace. I'm reminded of the words of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 48 and verse 22, Isaiah says, There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. And so, as much as our world needs ceasefires, as much as our world needs, needs armistice agreements, as much as our world needs treaties, all of that reduces and maybe eliminates conflict. But what our world really needs is righteousness. It, it's the presence of Jesus who allows us to come alongside of those who hate us, the presence of Jesus who allows us to come alongside of those who despitefully use us, who mistreat us, and love them the way God loves us. And by the way, who's the supreme example of that peace? None other than God himself manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. Because God sent his only son to, uh, to the world that did not accept him, but rather rejected him. And demonstrated what? Demonstrated love to a hateful world. And so when the Bible talks about peace, it's important for us to realize it's not just talking about the absence of conflict. It's talking about the presence of righteousness that can only be manifested through the person of Jesus Christ. Here's the second question in your outline as we, as we move along. The second question is this then. How can I obtain peace? How can you obtain peace? Well, well, the first thing I said very simply is this. You cannot be a peacemaker until you are a peace receiver. Think about that today. You, you cannot be a peacemaker until you are a peace receiver. What does that mean? You cannot give out what you do not possess. It's impossible for you to do that. I could look at you this morning. You might come up and say, Pastor Brian, I have this tremendous need. I have this financial need. Could you help me with that need? And I might put my arm around you and say, you know what, man, I really feel for your need. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you $10,000. Now, you might sit back and say, oh, my word, what a generous response. Well, it's a generous response, but it's also an empty response because I don't have $10,000 to give. I'm promising to give you something that I do not possess. And so what I mean by that is in, in order for us to be peacemakers, we first must be peace receivers. We first of all have to receive the peace that God gives to us. I alluded to John chapter 14 and verse 27. Jesus says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be 
afraid. So the good news is that God desires to give each and every one of us peace. Now, there, there are two types of peace that are mentioned in the New Testament. The first is this, and I, wanna, I don't want to go too quickly, but we have a lot of information to cover. The first is this. You and I receive peace with God when by faith we accept and appropriate the work of Jesus Christ. Let me take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Remember what happened there in the Garden of Eden? God placed Adam and Eve in a perfect environment. Perfect environment, free of sin, free of contamination, free of everything. And you know the story. I don't have to reiterate the story. Uh, In the midst of all of that, sin entered into the garden. And not only did Adam and Eve sin, but the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 that you and I likewise are sinners just like our grandparents, Adam and Eve. And so when they lost their peace, guess what? You lost your peace and I lost my peace as well. And each and every one of us are born might not like the term, might not be politically correct, but it's a biblical term. Each and every one of us are born sinners. I talked about last week my little granddaughter. We don't have to teach Isabella to sin. We don't sit back and say, now let me teach you the ins and outs of lying. Let me teach you the ins and outs of disobeying. Let me teach you how to talk back to your mom and dad. We don't have to do that. It comes what? It comes natural. And as beautiful as she is, she's a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is no one righteous, no, not one. So here's what happens. Your sins, whether it's Uh, whether there is a lot of them or whether there's just a few of them. Your sins and my sins have separated us from God. They've kind of cut off the peace that God desires to have with us. Here's the way the prophet says it in Isaiah 59 and verse 2. But your iniquities, which is just a big word for sin and transgressions, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's what happens. Because of our sins, whether they're many or whether they're few, because of our sins, we have been separated from God, the source of our peace. And because of our sins, we don't have peace. We are peaceless if that's a term. You might sit back and say, Brian, man, that is a discouraging message today. It would be if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ came and lived just as you and I are living and was faced with all the temptations that you and I are faced with, with one marked difference. He didn't sin. He was perfect. He lived a perfect life. And as the perfect sacrifice, fulfilling all of the Old Testament demands of righteousness and perfection, Jesus died on the cross for us as the sacrificial lamb, paying the price for all of our sins. And so here's what happens. By faith, by recognizing him, and by believing who he is and what he has done for us, I appropriate into my life the perfection of Jesus Christ. Here's the way the apostle Paul describes it in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have, catch it, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul uses a word that that maybe we're not familiar with, the word justified. Here's what the word justified means. Simple translation. It means this, just as if I had never sinned. So here's what happens. The moment I recognize my sinful condition, and the moment I recognize that the answer, the only answer to my lack of peace 
The only answer to my sinful condition is Jesus Christ. When I recognize that, and when by faith I turn to him, there's a legal transaction that takes place. All of my sins are placed into the account of Jesus Christ. And all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ is placed in my account. So therefore, God is able to look at me and God is able to look at you, and God is able to declare us righteous, perfect, just as if we had never, ever sinned. So Paul says, therefore, being justified by faith, I have what? I have peace with God. And so Brian the sinner, and and even though I look pretty good on Sundays, I still sin occasionally, all right? Isn't that right, Vic? She's back there telling somebody all of the sins that I committed. She's back there saying it, all right? Doesn't, Doesn't mean I'm perfect because I'm not. Now, God is changing me, and I'm a work in progress. I got a under construction sign on my life, just like you have an under construction sign on your life. But when God the Father looks at Brian today, God the Father doesn't see my unrighteousness, my imperfection. Here's what he sees. He sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been imputed into my accounts. And so I receive the peace with God whenever I by faith accept and appropriate the work of Jesus Christ in my life. By the work, we talk about his perfect life, his vicarious death, and his resurrection. I would say this, if there's never been a time in your life in which you have personally appropriated, believed on with all of your heart, and trusted Jesus to forgive you of your sins, and you have claimed his righteousness and his righteousness alone, you do not have peace with God. But today you can there's a second type of peace that is, that is mentioned in, in, the, in the New Testament. It's not peace with God. It's the peace of God. The peace of God. It's that, it's, that, it's that calmness in our hearts. It's that tranquility that God gives us. Two verses, John chapter 16 and verse 33. Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Catch this. This is so just like what's happening today. In the world, you will have tribulation. Can anybody relate to that today? All right? Don't look at your spouse when I, when I ask that question, all right? All right? Can anybody? In the world, you will have tribulation, Jesus says, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And the idea is this, in the midst of a troubled world, in the midst of chaos all around us, in the midst of crime, in the midst of a society that is degradating itself over and over and over again, you and I can experience the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, and the peace of God, that's what we're talking about, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So so here's the idea. God not only wants to give you peace with him, he wants to give you this internal peace. He wants to give you this internal tranquility that allows you to experience real peace even during the most troublesome moments of your life. You say, Brian, what moments are you talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about that time when you show up at your doctor's office and the doctor out of the blue looks at you and says, man, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you've got stage four cancer. At that moment, you can't experience the peace of God. I'm talking about the moment when your boss looks at you and says, man, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but we're downsizing our company. And I know you've been here 30 years, but you know what? we got to get rid of somebody. It makes more financial sense for us to get rid of you rather than somebody else. you got 30 days. The peace of God. I'm talking about when you stand, as we had just last week, beside the casket of your husband or your wife or your child, and you're grieving. 
you're able to experience the peace of God, even in the most difficult situations. As a pastor, I do a lot of funerals, weddings and funerals. We, we, we birth them, we marry them, and we bury them is what they say about pastors, all right? I'm able to experience that whole gamut. Um, you can, as a pastor, I can sit back and there is a, the, there's a marked difference between the way believers, mature believers grieve and between those or, or, or and also those who don't have hope grieve. I didn't say that correctly, but there's a difference between that. There's a difference. Paul says it this way, we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve differently because we do have hope. And so even in those most difficult situations in which the world would say, man, there's no way that you can experience peace, you and I can experience peace. And so we experience the peace with God whenever we appropriate by faith the works of Jesus Christ. And we, we, we experience the peace of God whenever we by faith appropriate the words of Jesus Christ. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Man, during those difficult moments, I take what Jesus says in Psalm 23. Even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, you will not be alone. I will be with you. And I take those words and I apply it to my life. I apply, to my, I apply Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 when God says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches in Christ Jesus. You might not know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I want you to trust me. And when we sit back and say, okay, God, I don't get it, but I'm going to take the truth of your words and I'm going to apply it to my life, I'm able to have peace. I spoke with one of our men yesterday who's going through a difficult situation and said, man, Brian, you know what? The funds are running out and I'm not sure what next month holds but I'm okay with that. I have peace because I'm trusting God for what happens in the future. And so when Jesus talks about blessed are the peacemakers, he's talking about that, that peace that only Jesus can give to us. Peace with God and the peace of God. So let me quickly answer the third question. What does it mean then to be a peacemaker? Uh, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. So now that we understand what peace is and how we can obtain it, we're ready to be a peacemaker. So, so, so what does it mean to be a peacemaker? I sat back and thought a couple of things. First of all, does it mean that I'm going uh, to dress up in, in 1970s style clothing and walk away saying, peace, brother? And I, I, I'm just going to say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to walk around and going to look at everybody and say, peace. Peace, Matt. Peace, Will. Peace. I'm a peacemaker. That's what I'm going to do. That's not what Jesus is talking about. You know that as well as I do. Does it mean that we make great big signs that say, peace. I'm against war. I'm going to be a peacemaker. Is that what Jesus is talking about? It's not what Jesus is talking about either. Does it mean what John Lennon wrote about in his song, Imagine? I'm, I'm dating ourselves, but uh, in John Lennon's song, John Lennon says, imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. And so we walk around singing John Lennon songs. And we're peacemakers. No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Three things, quickly. A peacemaker endeavors to be at peace with all men. A peacemaker endeavors to be at peace with all men. Listen, the simple truth is this, that as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be the least conflictive, we should be the least problematic. Can I get an amen about that? I mean, as followers of Jesus Christ, if anybody demonstrates peace, it should be whom? It should be us. And yet sometimes that's not the case. So sometimes as Christians, man, we're at each other all the time. I mean, all of us here have church fights and church conflicts and uh, never happens at Hollywood Community Church to our guests that are here. 
We should be peaceful. We should be the ones who are always striving to forgive. We should be the ones who are always striving to resolve conflicts, to restore relationships. Why? Because that's what God has done to us. God made the first move for us. He didn't sit back and say, hey, you know what? You're the one that's in the wrong. It's not me. I'm waiting for you. No, God made the first step to us. Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his love to us when we were what? When we were sinners. He made the first move to us. He's the one that reached out to restore us. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, if possible, so far as depends on you, live peaceably with all. Listen, I get it. It's not always possible because in any conflict there are what? There are two parties. I get it. It takes two people to dance. It takes two people to fight. I get that. But Paul says, as it depends upon you, you do everything you possibly can to restore relationships. The New Living Translation says it this way, do what you can to live at peace with everyone. You say, Brian, how do we do that? Let me give you three ways. They're not in, in your outline. I'm gonna give them to you really quick. Okay, the first is this, have a long fuse. Have a, some people take pride in having a short fuse. Well, I just blow up quickly. That's the way God made me. Really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the way he made you, but it's called what? It's called sin, all right, don't accept it. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Here's the second thing. Forgive quickly. Forgive quickly. Jesus says in Matthew 5.23, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer a gift. Now, sometimes because that's not written in our language, we don't mean, we don't understand what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. He's saying you come to church and you begin to worship and the offering plate is being passed around and you're about to put it in and all of a sudden you look over and there's that person that you have a conflict with. Jesus says before you can really worship, you need to go and resolve that conflict with that brother or that sister. You know what we do? I'm gonna step on some toes and I'm not thinking about anybody, but you know what we do? We sit on the other side of the auditorium. We go to another church, so we don't have to approach that person. And we don't what? We don't forgive quickly. Paul said, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And so forgive quickly. Let me give you a second thing in your notes. A peacemaker leads others to make peace with God. Our goal is to lead others to make peace with God. I won't take the time to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, but you know the passage. Paul says, if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. And then he says, you have been commissioned to be a reconciler. In other words, reconciling other people to God. And then he makes this statement, for you are my ambassadors. Every single one of us who have been reconciled, who have re received the peace of God, it's our job to lead others to make peace with God as well. Then the third thing is this, a peacemaker leads others to make peace with others. A peacemaker leads others to make peace with others. What does that mean? Don't gossip. Don't pit one friend against another. Don't, don't be the one who causes conflict. I'm reminded of what uh, uh, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 30, or, or the author of Proverbs 30 wrote, for as churning cream produces butter, and as a twisting nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Sometimes people are, are excellent agitators. They have the gift of agitating. Kind of get something going and then walk away, kind of take pleasure in seeing what's going on right there. Man, as a believer, don't be that way. All right, as a peacemaker, it's your job to lead others to make peace with others. 
Ephesians 2, wish we had time to talk about it. For he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Here's what Paul says, man, if Jesus can bring Jews and Gentiles together, can't we be reconcilers as well? And can't we be peacemakers that produce peace? Hey, listen, here's the idea. Not only does Jesus give you peace, but he has called you to be a peacemaker. I put this out on Twitter last night. What if believers decided to to refrain from conflict and choose rather to point people to the cross where Jesus has already conquered conflict? What if we chose to do that? Last question, and I'm done. What does it mean to be a son of God? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the son and daughter of God. Very simply, to become a son of God means this, that I believed and I'm trusting in Jesus, in Jesus alone. Hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 1 and verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. He gave them the right to be called the children of God. Think about that. If we place our faith and trust in him, we have the right to be called the children of God. I trust that's who you are today. One last thing. What does it mean to be a son or daughter of God? As sons of God, it means that we demonstrate the character of our Father. We reflect the character of our Father. I want you to see these verses, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45. Jesus said this, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's kind of the world's philosophy. Love those who love you, ignore those who don't treat you well. Jesus says, but I say to you, we're getting there, by the way, because we have these words. You've heard that it was said, but I say to you. Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Why? Notice what he says. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's not a a purpose clause. He's not saying that the only way you can be a son is if you reflect it. The idea, the, the, the verbiage that is used is this. As a son or daughter of God, you will reflect God's character in your life. What does that mean? You love not only those who love you, but you love those who hate you. You love those who abuse you. You reach out and you care for those who don't care for you. Why is that? Because you're a peacemaker. You're a son of God. You're a child of God. Do you think, church, we could make a difference on our community if every one of us walked out of here today saying, this week, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm not going to be a problem maker. I'm going to be a peacemaker. And I'm not only going to demonstrate peace and love and compassion to those who show it to me, but I'm going to demonstrate it to those who don't show it to me as well. Why do I do that? Because that's what God has done for me. And as a son and daughter of God, I'm going to reflect the character of my dad. 